Hello, my name is Miles, and I am your host of Stop Stigma, Start Healing, the raw and uncensored podcast where we talk openly and unapologetically about our lives as trans, lesbian, bi, gay, queer, and HIV-positive humans. Our goal is to stop the stigma that prevents us from getting the health care we deserve. Each episode will feature real people in our community and conversation and storytelling. And here's my disclaimer. The experiences shared here are valuable and important. They are based on the lives of those in the space and some of you who are listening. Prepare to be educated, shocked, seen, triggered, and informed. But no matter your response, keep the conversation going. Start healing. So welcome to uh, our next episode of the series that we decided we were going to call Gay or Aging in the Gay Life. Aging in the Gay Life. That was named by Chris. So we actually had to pause and think about it because as our brains get older, it's hard. To <laughs> My brain's the oldest just, of the bunch. What we just talked about two minutes ago. So I'm going to have um, my awesome guests go around, um, tell you their first names, their pronouns, and just a little bit about them before we get into this captivating topic. And you want to go first? Sure. My name is Anthony. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, his. 47-year-old gay male. Um, I work in the addiction field. I'm a therapist at a treatment center. Um, and I came out um, as an openly gay man 31 years ago. Great. Thanks for being here. After surviving a Beyonce concert. After surviving a Beyonce concert, I am still sore and my feet are still killing me, but it was well worth it. I just wanted to make sure we said Beyonce, so maybe we would trend. So, <laughs> wow. Right. Thanks. How are you? I'm John. My pronouns are he, him, his. I'm a 63-year-old gay male. Um, I work in finance. I've been in the banking profession most of my career and have lived in Columbus for about six and a half years. And you're gay? <laughs> I had no idea. Shh. Don't okay. tell. Okay. It's our secret. <laughs> My name is Chris. My pronouns are he, him, his. I am a genuine gay dad and gay grandpa. I am 65 years old and the oldest member in this panel. Um, I came out at the ripe age of 40 with the whole uh, American dream, house in the suburbs, white picket fence, dogs, kids, minivans. And I survived it. Not minivans. Minivans. You didn't tell me minivans. I would have told you you're not allowed to come tonight. It was an Aerostar Eddie Bauer. Was At it? least it was designer. Okay. It was a designer <laughs> minivan. So that is amazing. So Not a Honda Odyssey like oh, everyone's God, no. driving now. So in gay years, you're technically 27. So you haven't hit the mysterious gay death, which we're going to talk about shortly. You came out at 40 and you're 67. That makes oh, you. I'm not 67. Oh, I'm not even 66 65. yet. 65. So Ooh, you're 25. Miles. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> See how quickly the brain slips. <laughs> My goodness. So I have some shocking data okay. from UCLA. Uh, they did some pulling together of data from different um, census and, and different um, places that gather information and spit out data. And I pulled it up on Google. Google. So I'm going to bring it here tonight. This is the unscientific data. Uh, sharing as part of the podcast. So currently there are 2.4 million LGBTQ adults over the age of 50 in the United States. However, by 2030, they're projecting those numbers will double to over 5 million. So somehow in the next seven years, we're going to get 2.4 million of us over the 2.6 million of us additionally over the age of 50. Wow. And I, oh. something that just triggered is we are of the generation of the AIDS crisis. Yes. And it's that's on what here. really yeah. knocked down oh. our population. So maybe that's why some of the numbers a seem a little lower. Yeah. Right like they've, mm -hmm. not like they've necessarily doubled, but there's just so many that are missing, missing. from this You're right. group. Right. Thanks for that reminder, Chris. Yeah. Uh, compared to heterosexual cisgender adults, uh, we, as a community, we have a higher uh, rate of health disparities, 
partly because we have historically had to conceal our identities in healthcare because of the discrimination. And I would AIDS. also say because of HIV AIDS. and AIDS. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we have a higher rate of substance use, mental illness and isolation. Yikes. Um, the, you can hear examples of that in other podcasts we've done in the series. We have a higher rate of lifetime discrimination and physical and verbal abuse. And we are less likely in our older age to be cared for by, by our biological families. Um, we do have the opportunity to be cared for by our chosen families, right. um, but, um, but our biological families are less likely mm -hmm. to take care of us in our senior years. You may be the exception to that since you have created an arsenal of humans under your yeah, there's only, DNA. There's only six, six grand, well, not quite seven grandkids okay. and three children but it's more than i have when i <laughs> me you know, too when i have hit my low spots when my partners have died never heard a peep from my oh. kids wow never wow. heard a word so the biological family even though my kids think more like i do um uh, they're just they're all caught up in their own groups it's generational i think that they're just focusing more on them and their little pod and the hell with everybody else You've dealt with the isolation big time, many times, big yeah. time. Yeah. Okay. Well, so let's, so we are, we are gathered here really to talk about aging in our, in the gay community. So, um, I'm not going to speak on behalf of the LBTs in our, uh, continuum because there's no one here tonight representing that group, but as G's, we can, we've got some people here. We can, we've got some opinions that we can share. Um, and there's this myth that lives in our community that we perpetuate. We hear it, it's a term that we hear often, although you said you'd never heard I never of heard the it. myth of gay death, mm -mm. that there's mm -hmm. this magical thing when you turn 30 that we die. And I think that sets forth, sets forth this, this um, uh, the disappearing act of the gay man as we age. That we become increasingly more invisible in our community with the exception of the gay dad, the daddy, right? We hear a lot daddy. about the gay dad, yes. mm -hmm. yeah, uh, which is different than the biological gay dad, but mm -hmm. the gay daddy in our our community, mm -hmm. which is for those listening at home, that is an older gay male who um, has particular physical attributes that are admired by uh, the younger people. Is that gay dad, or you're familiar with that concept? Never heard of before. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm teasing. <laughs> yes, I have. We're bringing Anthony along. He's he's not feeling the the wisdom and age that the three of us have, but we're here to teach him as he approaches. We'll get you up I'm to speed. I'm a vessel. Uh, yes, he's here I'm to learn. He'll know what to expect. <laughs> yes. So, gay death was a concept familiar to you two, who I know both of you came out after that mm -hmm. age 30. But have you heard of right. that? Yes. 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 And you have anything more to say than just yes? <laughs> uh, you know, I'm double the plus the age of gay death. And it's very prevalent with the younger crowd. You know, if you're a daddy that's going to be a sugar daddy. Mm -hmm. That's exactly. one thing. Yes. If you're a daddy that's going to be a splendid daddy. <laughs> well, not so much. <laughs> I mean, it's, it, it boils down to how much money you're going to spend say a financial on those gain. kids. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, I'm not doing it. I raised mine already. I put mine through college. Okay. Ohio State got a lot of my money. And I'm just, I, I look at the younger bunch, and they're fun to look at, but they're arrogant. Self-absorbed. Thank you. Um, and just have absolutely no use for anybody over 30 40. i mean it's just it's i've found it to be very very true okay and remember that we're trying to bring them along so we, <laughs> we'll try not to alienate all you know? of the young people but to right. open their eyes to like there is some bias and i think yeah. in our community towards and, and i think as in and we've had conversations uh and we had conversations out front to prep you for this but there's this even as as older aging gay men, we tend to fancy the physique of a younger man. Mm -hmm. True or false? True. Yes. True. 
True, okay. absolutely. Which I don't think is that unusual, even in the straight community, that mm -hmm. um, that that phenomenon happens. But we're trying to transcend that, right? All right. Well, I just also looking at them and thinking, why wasn't I like that when I was younger? You know, yeah. but, you know, you you sense your body getting older, and you see somebody with a younger body that's in shape, and you think, wow. You know, if I had taken my taken care of myself like that when I was younger. Where would I be today? Where would I be today? Yeah, exactly. Right. But I also think that the age of 30 being gay death, as our gay population ages, I think that mm -hmm. that might advance more closer to 40. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. I, do, I do think that a lot of, you know, what I remember, you know, when I came out at 39, um, I've been out for 24 years, um, 20s was it you know now I'm, I'm seeing guys in their 30s you know they're turning 34 35 36 and they're like in their prime hmm. yeah so it's trending up perhaps i think it's trending upward i think the age is trending upward a little bit and i think as our population ages we're going to see more of that where maybe 40 is going to be gay death Mm -hmm. I mean, when I was 50, I was still going out to clubs and staying out till two or three in the morning. Couldn't do it now if I tried. <laughs> How about to say, there's hope for me. You got to find a club first. Yeah. Right. right. Well, I was, yeah. I was living in South Florida at the time, you know, so I was doing that. But I didn't. Now I, I'd rather be in bed. <laughs> yeah, I'm in bed by nine every night, like literally. When did that start for you? Um... Probably when I started working for the county six years ago, because I get up at 5 a.m. every day. I'm just like, mm, like it's like an inner alarm clock, mm. and I'm just kind of setting my way. So probably like right after I leave here, I'll go home, up my eyes will start getting heavy. I'll be in bed by nine. Wow. Like clockwork. But don't, don't you think, too, that when we're younger, we think we're invincible yes. and we can do those things and we can stay out later and, and it's not going to affect us that much. And now if I don't get a few, hour, you know, at least four hours sleep, I'm, I'm non-functional. Rest was not that important to me in my twenties and thirties. Now it is. Right. Well, and there's a biological piece to that, right? I mean, the, when we are younger adult men, we do have more hormones raging through our bodies it is easier to bounce back after a weekend mm -hmm. clubs or, you know, going out dancing on a Wednesday night. Yeah. You could do that and then still get to work on Thursday and do okay. Um, we, uh, I think all would need to call off for the week if, yeah. if we were to do that now. Right. I it mean, also helped if you went out to a diner for breakfast after you were out all night and, you know. To absorb the alcohol. Yeah. And, and, yeah, and <laughs> had, had breakfast alcohol, at six and then. Go home went, and shower and go to work. Went to work. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Or not shower. Just, uh, <laughs> really. Ew. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know. Well, hey, there's that's just nothing wrong with that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, boy. How old were you when you came out? 16. Okay. So oh. we have a similar sort of trajectory. 1992. Here. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. I was a little bit before that. But... We're in the same bracket. Yeah. Yeah. The same bracket. We would have ridden the same school bus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Yep. I'm sure. And I drove that school bus. And you drove that school bus. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, you stop it. Well, so let's talk about sort of your, and, and, and you and, and you two both, because you two come from sort of a different place than we do, but what were your early experiences of sort of interacting with the gay community like where were you doing it how were you doing it who you know what was that like for you for me it was doing everything behind the scenes because i wasn't out yet and it was brett's bar up in toledo and it was the place to go to dance and if you know all the gays were there mm -hmm. and that was my intro my gay 101 if you will Mm -hmm. And that was the start of me saying, I can't ride both sides of the fence anymore. And, you know, after you get splinters in your butt from that wooden fence for a while, <laughs> you know, it's, it's time to, <laughs> to make a decision. Wow. And I just, you know, I was, I mean, I was suicidal with, mm -hmm. with coming up. Mm -hmm. It was just because I knew what I had gotten myself into with a family and the whole bit. I knew what the Baptists were going to do to me. Mm -hmm. And 
I knew what I was. And I just, I've kept vacillating. And like I said earlier, when I came out, it was like a bowl in a China shop and lots of China broke. Mm-hmm. Okay. Wow. Wanna go next? Yeah. Um, well, I was, I was married 16 years and- uh, To a woman. To a woman. Um, I have a 34 year old son who's also gay. Oh, wow. And um, I came out and then a year after a year after I divorced, I came out and I had already left the Baptist. They kicked me out when I divorced. Um, so um, I met a few people online. And at that time, you were talking to people on IRC and AOL, m for m and all that, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know, where you had to listen to that awful tone, you know, to sign on for one thing. Um, and my first experience in any club was here in Columbus and a friend that I had met, uh, a friend from Mansfield that I had met, decided that I needed to experience everything in one evening. So we came to Columbus and went to a a very low key bar called the Downtown Connection. Oh, I remember Downtown then Connection. Then we went to um, was it Trade Winds? I, I believe. Then we went to Eagle, and then Eagle and Exile. I was about to. I was about oh, to yeah. mention Exile. So he said, "I wanted you to experience the gamut of oh Jesus of the gay gamut. bars." <laughs> and but the very first time we got out of the car, when we got out of the car uh, across the street from Downtown Connection very first thing that happened was someone drove by and called us. Yeah. And I said, I have to go. I, I can't do this. Mm-hmm. And he said, no, you're going to do this. You're going to experience that. Right. You it's know, just so, part of the full And this spectrum. was right after I came out. So it was... It's like 1968? 19- <laughs> <laughs> no. It was 1999. <laughs> right. 1999. <laughs> Punctuating and, how late it is. I was yes. trying to help. Yeah, you were trying to help me. <laughs> um, but that was that was where I first started. And then when I I, I lived in, um, at that time, I, I still lived in my hometown. And I was gradually coming out to people then and my family and friends and coworkers and so forth. And um, I realized that I needed to get out of my hometown. It was a small town and move to a larger yeah. community. So I, I moved to another community in Northeast Ohio that had a few gay bars and, but it was, it was a struggle because I would still look over my shoulder, even though I was out to a number of people, I would still look over my shoulder before I'd go into a bar. How about you? So my story is the, the opposite of you guys, but you remember this from last time I came out at age 16. And the beautiful thing is a lot of times the black community, they tend to be, the black community from my experience tends to be very homophobic because of religion. I did not have that experience. Um, mm-hmm. Came out at age 16, took my mom about a year to wrap her mind around it. She was great after that. My entire family embraced it. My mom used to go to the Eagle with me. Sweet. Back in like 1996. Wow. She was <laughs> the secretary of P flag here in Columbus for two years. Wow. Um, used to go to gay pride, whether I was in town or, or, or out of town. So I did not have a horrible coming out experience. Um, first bar that I went to, I snuck into the garage at age 16. <laughs> and then I started going to David's down under. Yeah. I don't know if you guys remember David's down under on main street. And then the Eagle and then yeah, my coming out experience was not horrible. It was, it was so easy. I almost feel bad when I hear other people's stories, but my entire family, well, having a, a lesbian aunt and gay cousin helped, but <laughs> yeah, I, it was almost kind of seamless. Yeah. My family was okay. Six to nine months later, they were like, okay, this is who you are, but you're going to rot in hell for it. Oh yeah. And, I didn't know it yet. and the, the most horrific thing that happened with my coming out was the church that I had been a member of for 25 years outed me to all of Northwest Ohio on a live radio broadcast by name. Mm. Mm -hmm. And I turned my car around on I-75 and was going to go back and get the pastor one. Was this part (laughs) of the broken China? Yeah. Yeah. And and the deacons wouldn't let me anywhere near him. (laughs) 
that's crazy. Yeah. It, it's it, sick. It, you know, paybacks. He got his. Yeah. The, um, and, and I think the reason why it's important to hear these stories, um, because I, you know, I don't want to say coming out is easy for anyone. Um, I think that the paths that you have created and, and our generation has created uh, has led to that coming out experience being slightly easier for younger yeah. generations. Mm -hmm. That, that mm -hmm. there, oh, is, there is a benefit to what we have contributed to the community mm -hmm. that I think it's important for them to remember. Remember, we didn't have an Ellen DeGeneres who was out on television every day when we came out. Um, we didn't have a little Nas on the radio mm -hmm. or on oh, yeah. I forgot Spotify about or wherever little Nas is doing like really awesome stuff mm -hmm. that is like a good sort of very public image. You know, right. you mentioned Beyonce's concert, like rainbows everywhere, rainbows everywhere and gay dancers and half, trans dancers. Half the audience easily, 50% of the audience yeah. was gay. It, yeah, totally different. There's, there's a whole lot more visibility now, I think because of the hard stuff that mm -hmm. I think we endured mm -hmm. decades ago, decades ago, decades and decades <laughs> ago. Well, coming from the boomer S generation too, <laughs> You're talking about our, our generation was more conservative overall. So coming out, even when I came out at 39, my coworkers were very disturbed by it. Mm -hmm. um, I had a boss who said, I don't approve of your lifestyle and i said it's not a lifestyle you know it's, it's who, who i am, am. Mm. totally and different. he said yeah. i don't approve of this and made my life pretty much hell for the next year until i left because i, I and i had been there 18 years and he was within the same generation i was but i see younger people now are so much more open mm -hmm. and and accepting of whoever you are you, you know non-binary doesn't matter you know, just totally accepting my son is is one of those people that just whoever you are is who you are and and you know in my generation it was like oh you can't be that way mm -hmm. <laughs> right yeah. i had to resign from my last job when i came out because the local priest in the small town told my friend that owned the funeral home mm. you get that homosexual child molesting pervert off your staff or mm. I will destroy your business. Mm. And I just very just... quietly resigned and slipped away. But it just... <sighs> and even what you just said is disturbing because people are so ignorant. 95% of child molesters are heterosexual men. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That particular priest got caught with an altar boy and got pulled out of the parish and had to sit behind a desk up at the diocese for the rest of his life. I need you doesn't, two to come back next time for our surprise, episode on religion. Doesn't Karma. surprise me. Yeah, yeah. Well, so let's go, let's talk a little bit about pride. What was pride like then? What's pride like for you now? I did my first pride in Columbus before I was out. Oh. And I marched with the Columbus Gay Men's Chorus. Oh which was part of my outing mechanism. <laughs> uh, they were, they became my family when my own family said, go to hell. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, for as many years as I was able to sing, it was still the family for me. Um, when, you know, I did that first pride, I did it wearing a promise keepers t-shirt. Mm. If you mm. remember promise keepers. Yeah. Yeah. My church tried to get me to turn in all of my pins and my t-shirts before I left town. And I'm like, uh-uh, I earned them bitches by sitting there listening <laughs> to that hatred. <laughs> but that was, I mean, that was my first pride and mm -hmm. I just thoroughly enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. And now as I get older, I don't like crowds. I don't come down to pride. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. How about for you? My first pride was probably with your mom, right? probably like 96 or 97. So I think I may have done pride with her like maybe 96. Yeah. And then my first major pride, Atlanta, Georgia, 1997. Mm -hmm. um, it was amazing then. I try to go to pride every, every when my mom was alive, she went with, went with me until she couldn't go anymore health wise. Now my, my nieces, my nephew, my sister, 
all actively go to Pride and, and support. They're all allies. Do you go with them? Uh, my sister and my one niece live about an hour from here in Beaver Creek. But my oldest niece went with me this year. Um, a couple years ago, my niece and her mother went with me. So my family is actively involved in going to Pride. Yeah. And I'm going to get to you in just a second, John. <laughs> but so what, if you don't mind me just taking it one step further, what was, what did you get from Pride then? And how has that changed now in terms of what you get or need from Pride? Mm, back then it was just like, like a fun event to go to. Now it's, I always say what I love most about Pride is now the amount of straight people that you see down there, mm-hmm. or husbands and wives with their kids decked out in Pride outfits. Um, I think it's, I, I call it the one time during the year. I wish the rest of the world was like the way Pride is during Gay Pride. Mm-hmm. Different races, interracial couples, heterosexuals and everyone's getting along. It's just nothing but love. Two years ago, my oldest daughter took all four of my grandchildren to Cincinnati Pride. Wow. I was just blown away. Did she enjoy it? Without you? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know anything about it. And she's like, Dad, she says, I took the kids to Pride. Mm -hmm. I'm like, (laughs) really? She says, yeah. And she goes, you know, they just loved it. They They just thought it was so cool because my two oldest grandchildren are 15 and 16 Mm -hmm. and they've had questions for me about being gay. And so by taking, my daughter said by taking them to pride and seeing the full spectrum, yes, she said it was very enlightening for all Mm -hmm. of them. So, you know, it it becomes less personal with Poppy Mm -hmm. as (laughs) much as they saw the entire community in the world and not the stereotypes that you hear about pride Mm -hmm. basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah, some they some. loved it though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's great. How about you, John? Oh, my first pride was early two thousands in Cleveland. Oh, I thought it was Janaid and Hutton. No, okay. or or yeah, no Tuscarawas or those yeah. places. No, it was in Cleveland, and with that experience, it was where I thought, wow, they're really. It really did seem like a sense of community because I saw more people gathered together of like mind and yet different backgrounds, mm-hmm. but, but definitely um, it felt like a sense of community. And then um, then I moved to Florida and I was in Key West in Fort Lauderdale and I did all of those, <laughs> which was different than North, so different than prides in the North, you know, in Northern Ohio. Yeah. Um, Definitely, it was just very more, much more open. Yeah, I can almost imagine. like a in in uh, Key West, it was almost like a Mardi Gras. I mean, it was mm. just very wow. Now I'm I'm a little like Chris. You know, I I I was at Pride this year, but it's like, oh boy, I I don't know if I want the crowd, the crowd, you know, the, the crowd, parking, the crowd, the parking. Yeah, um, yeah. and then it was, and it. It was looking at looking at it, thinking it's not so much for me anymore as it is for the younger crowd. Mm-hmm. I think it's it's there for me because I can see our community represented. Like you said, a lot of straight families. It's a lot of a lot a lot of different backgrounds. A lot of Again, diversity. Yeah, a lot of diversity. But it seems like it's something the younger people get into more than. I do now. Right. You know, I've, I've got that sense of, okay, I know I belong. So, you know. Yeah. Not a lot for us wiser, older, distinguished <laughs> gay men, right? Right. I don't well, want to sit can... in the grass and I don't want to wait in line for a beer. That's it's right. It's $12. I'm too lazy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm too old for this game. Yeah. It's like, it's like, yeah, I remember acting out like that, but no, yeah. not now. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. What is the best and worst part about aging as a gay man? Ooh. Let's do worst first. (laughs) Ooh. Worst? Apps. What happens... (laughs) I was about to go there. What happens to a person in their 60s that are on the the dating and hookup apps? Mm. Okay. You are just totally blasted as non-people, 
called Everything Under the Sun. Mm. And then you'll find this ray of sunlight, some 26, 27 year old that wants to play with an old guy. Mm. And it's like, <laughs> okay, you know, why do you want to play with an old guy? And the last, the last experience was because I have experience mm. and I have my head screwed on straight. That's, I mean, th the apps was by far the worst. But if we could just get this younger group to realize one day they're going to be here. Yeah. Because <laughs> I, I told a kid one day that gave me a bunch of grief. I said, if you live long enough living this crazy lifestyle of yours to be my age, I says, honey, you ain't going to look half as good as me. <laughs> <laughs> and turned around and walked away. What else is bad about aging? Body changes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Body image and body changes. Yeah. yeah. Um, realizing that you're getting older, you don't have the vitality that you had before, the energy that you had before. Oh, tell um, me about it. And just being an older, <laughs> an older person that, you know, maybe don't have the tolerance for the bullshit anymore thank you <laughs> sorry can i say that you can say whatever okay. you want yeah yeah thank you <laughs> <laughs> yeah you can cuss we're adults okay i can drop the f-bomb if i want you can yeah yeah <laughs> if there's too many of them rizzo may bleep a few so we can still be on youtube you know? <laughs> and if i can just kick back in yeah one of the other things that i have found as aging you know in the last 15 years i've buried two partners mm. and <clears throat> you know that you, you kind of look at, well, old people die, old people die. But as you're aging with them, you don't see it that much that way. Mm -hmm. But the first, my first partner that died was 43. Mm. That's young. And, you know, it just, he was just, he didn't take care of himself. Let's put it that way. Yeah. But to just end up then, you know, when Jim died in, in 2019, I've been alone since then. And that isolation and that nobody to talk to other than the cat, you know, it just, you sit there and you just wonder, should I still just keep pushing on? Mm -hmm. Because it just, it just gets to the point where you're just, you don't feel yourself anymore. Hmm. Have you experienced any aging? Yes. So for me, it's, there's a couple of different things. So one of the things I have to remind myself of is the same way that some of these young guys are acting on the app, I acted the same way. Mm -hmm. So I'm 47, but when I was 23, if someone that was in their 30s or 40s tried to talk to me, I'm like, oh, you're too old for me. Yeah. So I was very dismissive. I was a douchebag to people that were older, especially over 40. I'm like, oh, get away oh, from me, you fossil. Yes. <laughs> no one over 40. No one over 40. <laughs> and now that I'm 47, and people were like, uh, no you're, you're decent looking, but you're too old for me. I'm like, oh, clutching my pearls. <laughs> <laughs> not, you know, yeah. not remembering, like, yeah. I used to act the same way. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, body, the, the body changes. Oh, yeah. Um, and like I was telling you earlier, Miles, I think for me it's a little different because I deal with, yes, the ageism stuff, but I've heard some of the most some of the the worst racist interactions that i've ever experienced have been in the gay community mm -hmm. um and people like to think like gay people can't be racist oh. i'm like they oh. most certainly can oh. trust me um i had someone call me the n-word probably last summer i was like but you're gay he was like but that doesn't mean i have to like end and i was just like wow this was on an app on an app so yeah. I, I reported them Good. but I dealt with that through the 90s, 2000s. Um, I didn't realize, I just thought like, we're all gay, we're all in this together, not mm -hmm. realizing like there is a clear- There's a division. There's a division. There's a clear division. Um, it's gotten better, but it's still pretty bad. Yeah. There's Apps are good places to hide your hate. Yeah. Because you, you can't be seen. Yeah, you're but behind a keyboard. You're behind a keyboard. Mm -hmm. yep. when, yeah, well, it's I've experienced it on the apps and in person. I remember for years when I was still doing my party and putting stuff up my up my snout. I would be at 
after hours parties where it would be like me, my one other friend, who's another black kid, and a sea of white men. And we just felt like so honored that they allowed us you in. To be a part mm -hmm. of us. To, to be a part of it. So yeah, so I deal with the ageism, ageism and the racism aspect as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Gosh, I hate hearing that. And I know it's true. Like, oh, yes, it's, it's, true. Bad. Yeah, it's bad. It's, it's really bad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I am hoping that the younger generation is better, but I'm not. I think they are. I'm not are convinced. I think I think even the younger generation is better because as, as young gay men, we wanted separate spaces even from females. And so, and I know like growing up, like there weren't a lot of young black men in the bars I went to. Like mm -hmm. they were always few and far between. And, right. you know, it wasn't because there's not, there weren't young black gay men. It's just, they weren't welcomed. In I the was bars. just, they weren't welcome. Yeah. Right. The few that were brave enough to come in were probably because they came with their white friends. Exactly. Yeah. You just nailed it. And yeah. we had that segregation between the lesbian and gay community. That too. Up in the Akron area. And you could only go in, there was a certain lesbian bar that you could only go into if you were accompanied by a lesbian. Hmm. Yeah, if you were a gay man, you couldn't go in by yourself. They wouldn't let you in. And so fortunately, I had a, a lesbian couple as friends that would take me in and, and, yeah. and I was welcome. But that was that was a different. I think it's so different now. And, and I know it sounds like we're dogging the younger uh, the younger segment of our our community. But I will say that they are more open-minded oh overall. Totally. For overall, sure. they are so much more open-minded than our generation yeah. has been. And they're they're willing to accept a lot more um, differences. You know, mm -hmm. it used to be just gay, straight. Now it's gay, straight, Bi, trans, fluid, fluid you, poly, you know, everything. And there are people within the gay community that still are like, I don't get it. I don't get it. You're either gay or you're straight. And I'm like, that's yes. so close-minded. And, mm -hmm. and, and so it's, I do admire those younger than I who are more em embracing of, mm -hmm. of right. our diversity. Yeah. Um, but you do experience the ageism. Yeah, it's, it's real yeah. easy to sit up on the ivory tower and look down at the younger crowd and pick them apart. Yeah, yeah. But it's not so much being done in a negative manner as for me, it's an education hmm. because that's not how it was, you know, when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were told there's bachelors that live together down the street, <laughs> stay away from that house. Yeah. And <laughs> seriously, bachelors are right. or old maids. Yes. They were old maids or bachelors. Right. Yeah. Spinsters. 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 <laughs> yeah. But I, I look down now, not so much in a, in a condescending way, mm -hmm. but I, the way that the younger crowd interacts with each other yeah. is so much different than the way the younger crowd interacted even when I came out right. in 1997. Sure. Yeah. And I, I, I sit there and I'm like, damn, I wish I could have been a part of that. Mm -hmm. You know, it, yeah. part of it's envy. It really it is. is. Yeah. It is. It's envy of. I missed of out on having this. the opportunities and the openness yeah. that we didn't experience when we came out. They're less inhibited. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I will say though, it's, it's hard to break into those circles. I mean, I, when I'm in those spaces, I clearly know I'm the older person in those spaces. Like it's, and, and I, in my, I, in my brain, I still feel like I'm 25, but I know when I, kind of get into their shoes and they see me and they're like oh that's like someone my dad's age you're not older you're seasoned i'm seasoned yeah. there you, I mean, go. And, you know the ageism thing was is one of the main reasons why i stopped singing in the chorus yeah because the overall makeup of the chorus just Young, kept getting younger, younger. and younger and younger yeah. and i'm getting older and older and I couldn't do the choreography because of body, you know, body issues and stuff. And mm -hmm. it's just like, this is more for young kids now. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I would rather sit on the other side of the stage and watch, and watch them mm -hmm. having fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But let's flip to the, what's great about getting older? AARP. <laughs> well, this is not, I the AARP did not sponsor this. <laughs> I think slowly 
coming into acceptance of yourself. You know, yes, I have body changes. Yes, I'm, I'm feeling things that I didn't feel before when I was younger, you know, and, and maybe I, I can't stay out as late, but it's also like, I don't have to, mm -hmm. you know, I'm okay with going to bed early. Um, it used to be, I'd go out at 10 or 11 o'clock at night. Now I'll be happy to be in bed by 10 or, you know, 10 or 11 o'clock. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. But, the, but it's, it's, it's coming to, into acceptance. And then also it's good to find friends who are in the same situation you are that within 10 years of you, you know, where you can, you can relate to, to some of the same things and you're both, you know, your, your group of friends, you're all relating to the same issues of aging and how you feel about being part of the community and how you feel, how the community treats you. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. you, it's, it's kind of a, just coming into acceptance of this is part of life and it's kind of a cycle and it's time for, you know, new, new blood to, to kind of flow through the community and, and, and be, um, you know, bring that energy that, you know, that's needed to, to keep the uh, community alive. So, yeah. How about you, Chris? The best part of being gay is actually being able to look in the mirror and see me as me. I played the I'm doing what everybody else expected me game for 40 years. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to live out my golden years being who I am, mm -hmm. what I am. And if people don't like it, they can kiss my skinny white ass. <laughs> so sort of on, living sort of unapologetically. And yes. I heard pieces of that with John. Yeah. 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 I just I have to be me. Mm -hmm. And, you know. When pride's starting to come around, I've got my pride shirts on. I've had people, because I live near Dublin. Mm. I was coming out of the Dublin Rec Center one night, and a woman told me that the shirt I had on was absolutely disgusting. Mm. How long? Recently? This last summer. Oh, that's, in, that's but insane. She was, she was with two other blue hairs, and <laughs> so it was just like, okay, and I ignored her. I just kept walking. <laughs> and the further I walked, the madder I got. Mm -hmm. And I turned around, and said, you know what is disgusting? And she said, what? I said, go home, take a hand mirror and take a look up under your dress. Oh, that oh, is disgusting. Oh my <laughs> word. I was like, Chris is gonna go there. And he did. And, he did. and she just looked at me, she says, well, I, ne I says, well, maybe you never is because the reason you're as mean as you are today. Oh. <laughs> And wow. I just, then I turned around and walked away and the other two old ladies that were with her were just laughing hysterically because I put that old gal in her place. Yeah, you did. <sighs> it's about learning, learning to choose our battles too. Because okay. I, I sometimes still fight battles that I shouldn't be fighting because it's like, it's, is it really worth it? Yeah. Is it really worth it? Mm -hmm. You know, why do I want to put any energy I have into that when... I just need to be taking care of myself. And that's, that's how I look at dealing with my family now, mm -hmm. with my siblings and stuff. It's like, this battle is never going to be won. I might as well just avoid it, keep my blood pressure down, and move on with life. So learning how to let it go. How about you? What are your thoughts on, what's, what do you like about aging? Nothing. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm teasing. <laughs> you got um, the key to stop it? So it's a little different for me because... I, I'm not really around the gay community that much because a lot of my being immersed in the community back then had to do with partying yeah. and being <laughs> high on everything I can get my hands on. <laughs> and as you know, Miles, I've been sober for several years now, so I don't really feel the need to go out to bars. I quit doing that years ago. Um, my answer is similar to Chris's, except... Um, being unapolo unapologetic for who I for who I am, and I can kiss my husky black ass <laughs> instead of skinny white ass. Yep. No, but just being comfortable with my skin. But again, my my gay journey has not been horrible. I think it just makes a difference because of the kind of family that I have. I've never felt like I've had to. I've acted the same way literally for thirty some years because of the kind of family I have. So. 
it hasn't really I mean it's pretty much the same for me yeah I mean mm. my minus my, going out and drinking and partying and stuff yeah. my kids told me once they're like dad why are you so much in everybody's face about being gay and I'm like how do you why do you say that she says well you've got that sticker on your car you've done this you've got that I'm like yeah I am who I am and I'm proud of where I'm at in my life mm -hmm. so if they don't like it they don't have to look and you know my property manager where I live, she just loves it. She's lesbian and loves the fact that I have a pride flag hanging from my, the top of my, belt, of my patio that is visible from 270. You are the gay Clint Eastwood. Really? <laughs> and oh with, my God, he is. Yeah, <laughs> get off my lawn. He's a vigilante gay. Yeah. <laughs> you are like the gay Clint Eastwood. I love it, right? That's why Chris is here. So we're going to take a short break. <laughs> And we'll be back uh, to finish out our time together. So see you in a moment. Are you a friend of Dorothy? Are you family? Are you a little light in the loafers? Are you a tomboy? Are you in the alphabet mafia? We've been called a lot of things over the years. And in spite, we have found ways to connect and organize. Find support and connection that helps you heal. Let's talk. Check out the many support groups you will find at EquitasHealth.com. Start healing. So welcome back to Stop Stigma, Start Healing on our episode that we call what, Chris? Did you oh forget? God, here we go. <laughs> My old age is kicking in, <laughs> aging in the gay life. Okay, I think we just renamed it, but we'll take it. So, yeah, that was, yeah. that's, was that, it? That's was, what I said it was. I don't okay. remember because I See? have no memory in my old gay age. <laughs> so, <laughs> so let's, uh, we're going to turn the, the topic to a little bit around healthcare. Um, of course, I work at a healthcare agency and I like to talk about healthcare because that's one of the reasons why this podcast exists. So we can dispel some myths, encourage people to take care of themselves. But I think there's a unique experience in the gay community with um, HIV, AIDS, and PrEP. So we have a generational uh, relationship with HIV that has changed considerably. I think those of us who lived as far back as the, the 80s have one relationship with it, and those that are coming to age in the last 10, 15 years, 20 years have a different relationship with it so i thought i'd just sort of toss that in the center to talk about about hiv hiv aids and prep you know i'll talk about it yeah yeah um so well let me just say so for those who are listening at home prep is a daily medication you can take for uh, the prevention of hiv mm -hmm. so if you're someone who um is in a situation where you're um, having sex with other people and you want to protect yourself, you take a pill a day and that prevents you from getting HIV or AIDS. Conversely, on the other side, for those in our community that are HIV positive, there are medications that are now keeping us alive for normalized yeah, yeah. So mm. what used to be a death sentence now is manageable. something as manageable as mm. diabetes. Right. right. More I mean, manageable than diabetes. In mm -hmm. 2001, when I started medication yeah i was on four meds i was on some meds that nobody takes anymore i was on azt mm. and you know it was that was just part of the protocol mm -hmm. at that time and you know i was taking pills and pills and pills and pills now i get two shots every two months oh. and I don't have to worry about it. Cabinuva is the greatest thing that has come across the board. We are not sponsored by Cabinuva. But thank you. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, it's having HIV, it's, it's like a roller coaster because it will isolate you from certain people. And there's still the ignorant bunch out there, even within the gay community that don't believe you equals you. Which means mm. what? Undetectable is untransmittable. And how do you get undetectable? You stay on your meds like mm -hmm. a good boy. Right. Okay. Yep. okay. And as far as prep goes, I think it's the greatest thing going because condoms have been on the way out for years. <laughs> and somebody like myself, I'm latex, I'm latex allergic. So Yikes. condoms were always out of the question for me. And now that they've got these, the non-latex, whatever, it's like, 
I'm sorry, I'm undetectable. That thing is not going on me. Others, any thoughts or opinions? Pretty much what he says, like, I no longer view it as a death sentence. No. But I think the other thing that, I think a lot of times people think that if they get on prep, I'm like, that, that it protects you from HIV. It does not protect, it does not protect you from other things mm -hmm. as well. You know what I mean? Yeah. But so I think a lot of times when people hear like, oh, a pill to keep me from getting HIV. Like, let me just go fuck all of Franklin County, which is fine. I mean, I've probably done part of it. <laughs> probably but, done there. <laughs> <laughs> but no, but to me, I no longer view AIDS, HIV as a death sentence. Right. When I hear that someone's HIV positive, even if I'm uh, intimate with them, I don't sweat it, honestly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it, it building off of what you were saying about not getting the other things, they now have post-exposure prophylaxis. You take, you know, if you, and I'm on it. I mean, you, you take two doxycycline mm -hmm. within 24 to 72 hours of unsafe sex. Mm -hmm. And it will prevent you from getting the other wow the other I bunch say, I, of them. I didn't know that. Yeah, mm -hmm. it you know my my primary physician is gay and he knows me oh too well. <laughs> and he when I saw him earlier this year, he's like, "You're starting this," <laughs> and I'm like, "Really?" He goes, "Yes." He says, "Now that all of your parts are working correctly again, <laughs> you're starting this." <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> and. You know, it takes away, it takes away then the, oh my God, did he have something else? Mm. Right. And, you know, and that particular instance was the guy that I had played with, he gave me chlamydia wow. and he didn't know he had it. He showed me his negative drug panel and it, it just came out with, he says, well, I guess I'm, you're only as negative as your last partner. And I said, bingo. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I had to be treated and he had to be treated and, you know, it just doctor, you know, when my doctor said, this is what you need to be on, mm -hmm. it took a lot of the guesswork out of it. What about you, John? Um, yeah. Uh, I just remember the first time I remember hearing about HIV and AIDS and I was, it was in the eighties. Um, because you were still in the church at that I point? I was in the church. I was also, it was, uh, yeah, I, I was living very conservatively, yes. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I remember my ex-wife and I were attending a wedding out of state, and I was helping the father of the bride that morning getting extra chairs for the wedding. And he started talking about this new disease that's affecting the gays. The he said, cancer. no, they all deserve it because the they're all going to burn in hell. Yep. Mm -hmm. and, and he said, they're all going to burn in hell. They deserve it. And I thought, I remember thinking at the time, how can you say that people deserve to suffer? So much for good Christian life. Yeah. And so yeah. as, you know, I, I, even though I was still married, I, I, I did try, you know, I secretly kept an open mind about it. And then after coming out, um, I had a roommate that tested positive. This was back in 2000. And I just remember him being so afraid. He, he, he asked me to go to counseling with him because he was afraid that I didn't want him to be around my son. Yeah. He said, I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, I might give it to him that you, you might think that I might give it to him. And I said, are you sleeping with my 12 year old? And, you know, trying to be facetious. And, and right. he's like, no. And I said, what's the problem? Yeah. Because, well, our toothbrushes are in the same holder. And I said, mm -hmm. what's the problem? Yeah. And he, so I, I was educated on, yeah. I mean, he was, he was a drug and alcohol counselor and mm -hmm. he was like, he even had this attitude that he was, not good that he was you know he was bad for me to be living oh, with and it was it was terrible. horrible yeah. I, yeah. and i tried to you know i just said to him whatever you think um you know i said i i'm not concerned and um so he you know he got on his meds and he he of course 
he had he had suffered uh, pneumocystic pneumonia and he'd come close to death and then got past that got on his meds and then that's when i started hearing about prep mm -hmm. years after that mm -hmm. and um the first time i ever went for an hiv test was in my still in my hometown i went to my family doctor who i went to high school with and he said do you think you really need to be be promiscuous hmm. he said why do you have to sleep with other people and i said you know what <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's like hey i got and, and, too. And at the time i was dating a, a doctor and he was you know who we were very you know open about you know being careful and all that and he's my own doctor said you I don't care if you're dating a doctor or not. You don't know how, you don't know that he's carrying it. You should be more careful. The gay community is going to die. Hmm. And I thought, wow. So when, when I was able to get on prep, I did. And um, I've been on two different ones. I've been on Truvada and Descovy, both. And neither um, are sponsors of Stop no, Sigma, Start no. Healing. But I, I was on Descovy before all the trials were even done on it so um but uh i think it's i think it's great because i think it you know granted it doesn't take care of everything else but it helps it helps you know it helps with spontaneity it helps you know and i think that the the, the attitude towards hiv today is is much more like oh you're positive okay yeah okay yeah. you know, when i was First, in the dating pool, people would say, don't go out with him. He's positive. You know, Did don't go out with him. It? He's positive. Wear a, you know, wear your raincoat. You know, yeah. that was the thing that you would hear. And now it's like, okay, I'm on, I'm on prep. I know the person I'm with, mm -hmm. you know, says they're, you know, they, they say they're um, undetectable, but I'm still on prep. Right. I'm a senior citizen. I'm on prep and I'm fearless. I'm fearless. So for me, it's, I, I learned, I, I always had to keep an open, try to keep an open mind, but I feel like the attitude today toward HIV is much more accepting within the gay community. I think the straight community still has a lot of education mm, sure. to, to come yeah. to them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the things that I recall was said actually to me by someone was when PrEP first came out. And you know, everybody's saying, well, it's not gonna stop syphilis. It's not gonna stop this, that, or the other. And he said to this person, and right in front of me, but it stops the big one. The one we can't completely <clears throat> fix, it stops it. Mm -hmm. And they're like, penicillin will take care of the rest, but <laughs> we can't fix this one yet. And that, that stuck in my mind because mm -hmm. it does, it stops the big one. Sure. Although syphilis is pretty darn scary. Yeah. It's, There's it, a lot of uh, it's out of syphilis control. that is. Yeah. Uh, it's become meta, uh, medicine resistant. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. pretty scary yeah, stuff. And it's should people should be concerned about that. So that's never tighten sponsored up. Sponsored by syphilis. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm almost afraid to bring this up, um, but we're going to talk just a little bit about politics. <laughs> Because uh, we got some feels in the room, and, and for those who don't know, we've got a view of the state house behind us in this lovely studio. Um, but but the, the government's doing some stuff, right? And and many of us have have lived through uh, times that were uh, where where government didn't recognize us at all, mm. and then I think uh, we worked very hard to make some changes, and we've had some steps big back steps I yes say. um so just any thoughts or opinions you have on that from from this place where we sit i didn't <laughs> well let me let me rephrase the steps that we had made forward mm -hmm. um you know I, I look at those as no i wasn't at stonewall but i remember reading about it um mm -hmm. No, I didn't have AIDS in the 80s, but I remember Ronald Reagan's just blasting it. 
Oh, he was disgusting. I remember, you know, I remember these things going forward. And as we have progressed as a community, things just seem to level out and smooth out for all of us. Yes, we you always st- we're going to have the Jerry Falwells and, and, you know, Pat Robertson and all that crap. But, you know, they're rotten in hell now, so I don't care. <laughs> yeah, I said it. <laughs> but it's as, as we have moved forward, it's it's been a very comforting thing, you know, where I don't feel worried about having a flag on my car. I don't feel worried about somebody wanting to bash my head in because I'm gay. Mm-hmm. Now, maybe I'm living in a in a bubble someplace, but, you know, <clears throat> I'm out in the suburbs and I don't have a problem. But when they started taking this back steps, it really got my blood pressure up. It really did because it's like we have worked so hard to get this far and now they're trying to take it all away from us. They're trying to make it illegal again. They want to bring back the sodomy laws. I mean, it's just, it's like, what the hell? This is not 1952 anymore. Well, even the current, the current uh, legislation that's before the Ohio House and the way it's restrictive of drag performances, um, depending on where the drag performance is, if if there's somebody under the age of 13 that can view this this drag performance and they're exposed to it, then then that person who's performing drag could either be fined or uh, they could be found, it could be up to a fourth degree felony depending on the age of the person that views them, where, they perform, where they're performing, and how body their performance is. I don't know who's going to make that judgment call, but it, it goes from a, a misdemeanor to a fourth degree felony. Per- performing drag. Yeah. It's like, but nobody ever thought about Robin Williams or, or Tony Curtis or some of these other performers mm-hmm. in the past who've, you know, Dustin Hoffman, who, who performed in drag, nobody... Everyone thought that was really funny and cute. Because it was satire. Yeah. Well, and growing up, cartoons. Cartoons. Mm-hmm. Bugs Bunny and drag. Mm-hmm. You know, right. <laughs> All the time. Yeah, I mean, it was just like, okay, this is funny. Mm-hmm. And my dad would just, he would just sit there and go, that's just wrong. That's just wrong. And I'm like, dad, it's a cartoon for crying out loud. Well, I knew we were in trouble. Was it last year when they reversed Roe vs. Roe Maybe versus right. Wade. I'm like, oh yeah, this is going to start. It's a downhill. It's, it's, it's a, a domino, domino effect. Yeah, yeah, it's a domino effect. And compared to Ronald Reagan was bad, and people like George Bush were bad. But compared to Ron DeSatan and Marjorie <laughs> Taylor Greene, they were walking apart. Yeah. I feel like Ronald Reagan was conservative. I don't know. I was just a toddler back then. But I'm going to <laughs> not being serious. But I don't think yeah. that he had like hate in his heart per se when i when i listen to ron desantis and Mar- people like marjorie taylor green oh i just see pure hatred, hatred. and venom mm-hmm. yeah it's it's just vitriol it's horrid mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. and i mean i she was saying something one day she's and she disgusting was, she was just blasting about the transgenders and all this other and i was just sitting there thinking okay honey when did you do your transition because you definitely do not have the man the mind of a woman hmm. And it's just, it's like, my, you know, God. I think you can drop the other woman. You just don't have the mind. The mind, the yes. Mind. She dumber in a box of rocks. Um, but, we, you know, we had, like you said, the, the vitriol that we see from the politicians now. And I know it's just to cater to the base, the a certain segment of the crowd mm-hmm. to get their vote. You know, the more ex- the more upset they can get about a group of people then the less the focus is on how ineffective they are as legislators. Right. And, you know, and one of the things that immediate, I see the commercial from time to time still is a drag queen reading to a child is not killing that child. Right. Guns are killing those mm-hmm. children. But that doesn't matter. Oh, I know. Yeah. Because <laughs> we're all in the NRA's pocket. Yeah, yeah. You know, it just, and no, I'm not, you know, the NRA, but... It just, you're always going to have the haters. You've just got to be able to keep them as far from the media (laughs) as Mm -hmm. you can. Mm -hmm. Well, and to quote Taylor Swift. Which you will. The haters (laughs) going to hate, 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 hate. Mm -hmm. (laughs) 
I don't think I know one Taylor Swift song. <laughs> so with that uh, wise quote from Taylor Swift, um, I brought you all downtown to talk about the joys and the sorrows involved in being gay and aging. I like to make sure that I check in with you on what was the thing that you wanted to make sure that you got out there to the world of those listening to podcasts. What is that message? Aging is not a dirty word. It's okay for us to get older. It's important that we learn to accept ourselves for who we are yeah. and the changes that we're seeing. I'm, I, I battle with it every day, but it's okay. Getting older is not a bad thing. With age comes wisdom. There right. it comes. <laughs> That's Thanks. what makes the gray hairs. Thanks, Gay Yoda. Yeah. <laughs> um, Smart it was. <laughs> <laughs> Aging for me has just been, I won't say, I'll call it a downhill slide, but as body parts start to break and quit working and sag, and, and, true, and sag. And the belly, my mm. daughter is telling me, oh, dad, you're in your first trimester. And she's starting <laughs> her third trimester. Mm. And she's like, let's compare bellies. Mm. <laughs> but with the way modern medicine is improving on our lives and with the new technology where they can repair and replace parts that have stopped working with artificial devices, it's helping, it's, it's really helping me especially to look that, okay, I'm pushing toward the 70 mark, but I'm not ready to slow down and I can still, you know, <laughs> run circles around a 40 year old. So. I know where you're going. I, know where you're going. I, I mean, where else would it, where else would it go? <laughs> so have we convinced you that aging's okay? Aging is fun. Um... I'll wait till we come back next podcast. <laughs> no, no. The thing that, the point that I really wanted to yeah. get across for me is I can't, as a 47 year old gay black male, talk about ageism without talking about the other stuff that I brought mm -hmm. up. Yeah. Because for me, they go hand in hand yes. yeah. and they yeah. always have ever since I came out. So that's it. Well, just remember in two years, honey, you'll start getting AARP notices. Really? 49, mm -hmm. they start. What are I've been getting them for well, I'll, I'll 14 years. No, I've been a member for, for God, <laughs> you know, cause I was on disability. So I qualified for everything. I got my golden Buckeye when I was 50. There you go. And it's like, okay, do I use it? No, it'll get me a 10 cent coffee at McDonald's and that's about it. I mean, shit, I'll use it if you, if you won't. 10% <laughs> at Denny's. Really? McDonald's has a drag queen named Ronald Ronald McDonald, so don't take your children there. Oh. It could be a, an offense. <laughs> the state so legislation. Bad. Yeah. So gay aging, our eyes go bad, our teeth get brittle, our boobs sag, our hair grays and falls out. But we have age, we have wisdom, we have experience. Mm -hmm. We don't care anymore no, like we, not really it's not my filters are going choose, away we choose what we more care carefully about. what we care about yeah. yes and i have been asked if you could go back to 40 what you know would you and i'm like no yeah 40 was so so devastating for me and so you know such yeah. a huge transition yeah i wouldn't want to go back there and you know yeah i'm 65 oh well you know, if I live to be 70, it's a milestone. If I live to be 80, oh, hell no. <laughs> yeah. So. But I got a 93-year-old mom, so me too. what am I going to do? There you yeah. go. I do me too. Not. Yeah. So, so with that, I think we're going to close. So thank you all for uh, joining us on this podcast and look forward to seeing you in other places. Maybe. I don't know. Thank Good. you. Thank you. We're around. Take care. All right.